Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us for our Manufacturing and Distribution Roundtable focused on building a business strategy for 2024. My name is Mark Henry, and I'm a partner and co-leader of our firm's Manufacturing and Distribution Practice here at Citroen Cooperman. We have a great panel for today's session. First, Dr. Anurban Basu, who is chairman and CEO of Sage Policy Group. His firm focuses on providing economic and strategic analytical services to manufacturing and distribution companies, along with various other industries. Joe Bublé is Citroen Cooperman's managing partner for tax services. He's responsible for our firm's tax practice, as well as concentrating on strategic tax planning, mergers and acquisitions, and sophisticated tax research for businesses and individuals. And lastly, John Giordano is an attest partner and co-practice leader of the firm's manufacturing and distribution practice. He has nearly two decades of experience providing accounting and assurance services for middle market businesses and their owners. Thank you all for joining us today. So just to kind of kick things off, or before we kick things off, we have the Q&A, everyone knows Zoom, we got the Q&A section down below. We'll be doing a Q&A session after um, we do open Q&A. Um, send them directly to me or the Q&A feature uh, on the bottom of the screen. So let's kind of get things started. I think uh, let's start with Dr. Basu. I think one of the questions that everyone's talking about is, is the economy, is there a recession? Why are economists so split? on whether a recession is going to happen or happen soon, and where do you think the U.S. economy is headed? Yeah, economists are split. I mean, we just had uh, economists at J.P. Morgan and Bank of America in the last few weeks drop their recession forecast. Then you have economists like myself who still believe recession is coming. We got some evidence of, uh, of economic slowing uh, on Friday with the jobs report. I don't know if people have been noticing, but bond yields have been falling ever since. The value of the U.S. dollar has been as well as the perception is the U.S. economy is starting to really soften. Uh, and we are different because we have different uh, theoretical underpinnings. So there are neo-Keynesians, which is what I call myself in graduate school because I want to be attractive to uh, the opposite sex. Uh, but I'm actually a monetarist. And I believe that ultimately it's monetary policy that determines economic outcomes. And, um, and we've had this tightening monetary policy and Milton Friedman, uh, the godfather of monetary theory and uh, Anna Schwartz, the godmother, taught us that monetary policy operates with long and variable lags, which means, in my mind, that much of the impact of these higher interest rates is yet to fully permeate the economy. And that hit's about to come in a major way, and that's why I think at some point in the next 12 months we'll be in recession. But other economists are looking at economic momentum right now. They're looking at fiscal policy coming out of the federal government, and they're saying, my goodness, economy has momentum, lots of federal fiscal support out there, recession is not coming. So, you know, I just want to kick this off to you, John. Dr. Basu touched a lot of the strengths and weaknesses in the economy and what he sees coming. What are you, what are you seeing with your clients on the financial side? Yeah, I, I, I kind of agree with with what he's saying there. I mean, for, from our perspective here, what we've seen, it's like it's like we're in the middle of a never-ending seesaw, right? As one thing goes up, something else comes down. Something comes down, something goes up. So, you know, demand, you know, we were all – the demand was there for a while, but we didn't have the product. As we know, you know, container shortages and costs. So as the supply chain, the cost of the containers has come down, be more palatable, you know, the interest rates go up and kind of counterbalance that, that, that kind of savings that we're seeing. So, you know, the feeling is that a lot of costs have already been reflected in, in the pricing. Um, so how much more can we really off, offset to customers? Kind of like showing or, or trending kind of towards what Dr. Basu was saying. You know, that and that it's probably around the corner of this recession. I mean, like I said, a lot of the costs have already been p passed off. They're seeing a lot of the cost of capital going up. Um, I'm just really not sure how much the market will bear in terms of, of, of passing all these increased costs up, uh, holding costs for inventory, all these various different items. As as the inventory turns lengthen or, or shorten, for that matter, you have working capital lines that are now seeing increased variable interest rates. Uh, so all that holding cost of capital is there for companies um, that they have to bear. And again, like I said before, you know, where is that cost going? A lot of it's just affecting the bottom line of, of our clients so far, uh, because throughout the uh, throughout the container cost issues and various different uh, supply chain issues, a lot of costs have already been pushed into the purchase price or the selling prices of the products. So uh, I tend to agree a little bit, though, although we haven't seen major cutbacks yet. Um, I do think that uh, that there will be a slowdown, and there's more to come. Uh, Joe, same same question to you. Thanks, Mark. Well, what we're seeing in some of my clients is difficulty accessing credit markets, particularly in the real estate industry. I know this is not a real estate seminar, but that tends to be the leader in, in uh, 
capital crunch. We've seen banks uh, pulling financing packages that they've already approved. Had one real estate client had a refinancing approved, and they pulled it and went back to underwriting the entire process again. They came out with a new proposal, obviously a lot more um, less favorable from the client's point of view. And then a week later, they pulled it entirely. So we're seeing this happen a lot. In addition, uh, two recent tax law changes that took effect in 2022, which we'll talk about a little later, is causing a lot of cash crunch for our manufacturing clients. And we're talking about the ability to expense R&D costs and the interest expense limitation. That's a, almost came out, of, I wouldn't say it came out of nowhere, the law has been around, but the effects have been really dramatic this past year and we don't see it changing in the future. Real cash crunch and companies are finding it um, difficult to have the funds to pay the taxes. Well, I think I think you you both just touched on a huge issue. And the next question for Dr. Basu is: there was a fallout from Silicon Valley um, earlier this year, and what we've seen on the, on the client side is that started to kind of um, banks are behaving a little bit differently and, and tightening up their credit policies. Do you see an emerging credit crunch, and kind of how do you see that Silicon Valley wave coming through the market? I see it, and Joe mentioned it himself, right? Because credit is tightening up, and that's again. I think, to this lag effect for monetary policy. So Silicon Valley Bank falters on March 10th, Signature Bank on March 12th, then with issues at First Republic Bank, and then Credit Suisse and Deutsche Bank and Aquest and Western Alliance. So we had that. And analysts at the time, you might remember, Mark, were saying, well, this is idiosyncratic. These banks are different. And I think to a large extent that was right, that it did not lead notice to a full-fledged credit crunch or anything like that at that time. Here we are in November, eight months later. However, Several banks have been recently debt downgraded by the likes of S&P Global and also Moody's. Um, you know, there's a, the regulators are more, uh, are, are more likely to scrutinize aggressively bank balance sheets. And so when you put into account compliance costs, the risk uh, tolerance of bankers, and then also, of course, their cost of funding loans, which has gone way up, obviously, as money has become more expensive, you put it all together, the interest rate they need to charge to make a, a loan make sense to them is so high that in many cases, the deal doesn't make sense anymore. So you have an equilibrium interest rate that no longer works for many of the would-be borrowers or, or, or those who would be financed. And so that's why I think this economy is slowing. And yes, we are marching slowly to that credit crunch. And of course it hits real estate first, but then it hits construction firms and manufacturers and distributors secondarily. And I think some of that's about to hit the economy. And that's why I say recession is coming within the next 12 months. So just, to, just expanding on that, where do you see interest rates over the next 12 months? What do you kind of see the pattern of increase, reduction? Where do you see that all going? You know, when I look at various interest rates, let's say the one-year U.S. Treasury, it's been stuck at 5.4% for weeks. So what does that mean? It means the Federal Reserve is not making any moves. The last two meetings, they've paused. So they're not raising the short-term rates that they control. All the action has been those longer-term interest rates. Now, you might remember the 10-year U.S. Treasury, which we economists pay a lot of attention to, surge, the, the interest rate, the yield on that surge. But recently, with evidence that the U.S. economy is weakening, that, that bond yield has come back down. That's one of the reasons the U.S. equity markets have been surging higher themselves, which I think is the equity markets being complacent. So long story short, I think over the next six months or so, the Federal Reserve doesn't do much. Interest rates basically stay where they are. Here's the problem. They're already sufficiently high to suppress economic growth because inflation is still meaningfully above 2%. In fact, last inflation readings that were received, the Consumer Price Index, Producer Price Index, they were a little hot in terms of pricing. So inflation got back to 2%. We've got this red hot labor market. Wage growth is more than 5% by certain measures on a per annum basis. You put all that together, Mark, the, the Federal Reserve probably needs to slow, to, to reduce interest rates to get this economy back kickstarted again. They can't do it because inflation is stubbornly high. What can I tell you? After about six months or so, mid-year next year, I think the Federal Reserve starts to cut. And by the latter stages of next year, you'll see meaningfully lower interest rates than we have today but there'll be a recession that will intervene between this period and that. So, so going back to John, because you're just touching on what Dr. Basu just said and what you said earlier about, um, you know, cut your clients and, and their banking relationships. Banks are the underpinning of, of working capital and our, our clients' ability to grow. So what have you seen um, from your clients in terms of access to working capital, increases to line of credits? How, how has that gone for your clients? 
Yeah, again, I, I have to echo the comments. I mean, although banks that you meet with might say that they're interested in looking at new deals or whatever, the proof isn't, you know, the, pr the, the proof just isn't there. I mean, every deal that comes across their desk, you know, it's getting highly scrutinized. I, th I This is uh, obviously my opinion and from with people that I deal with, but you know, I just don't see a lot of movement with banks right now, uh, especially moving banking relationships, uh, taking on new new clients. Um, you know, the underwriting process has seemed to get a little bit more vigorous. Uh, they're really looking for that, you know, that golden egg out there. Um, and even extending terms with with current banks, you know, where we've had relationships with for a long time. You know, they seemed less and less inclined to kind of go outside the box, if you will. Um, what does that mean? Uh, essentially, you know, the biggest issue we're seeing right now, like I said before, is, is cash flow. Um, with a lot of increased costs in, 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 on the debt side, and especially with the working capital lines, uh, across the entire vertically integrated supply chain, you have vendors extending terms, you have customers extending terms. So uh, all that cash flow is getting tied up sometimes in the middle with in terms of, you know, slower collections, but accelerated payments. Um, so it's, it's, it's challenging. And, um, you know, to just kind of tie in what Joe said before in terms of, you know, the other things we're seeing on the tax side, I mean, with the R&D credits getting pulled back a little bit, but more importantly, the interest limitations, um, the interest rate deduction limitations, it's pretty crucial now because you're seeing a little bit of a decreased uh, demand in terms of the income. I, I believe 2014 is going to be a step back year for income uh, when compared to 2023. So the uh, the adjusted income on a tax return is going to be a little bit lower. So it's going to limit that that interest rate deduction. And then interest rate deduction is probably going to be more sizable this year, obviously, than it has in prior years because of where the rates are going. So, um, you know, what does that do? That, again, impacts cash flow to, uh, to the taxpayer. Uh, whether it be a, a cash paying entity, but more importantly for us and our clients is pass through entities. So that cash has to be paid for tax. And, you know, when you're having a little bit lower uh, interest rate deduction, uh, interest expense deduction, pardon me, um, more taxable income is going to flow through and that cash has to come from somewhere. It's got to be pulled out of the business. Um, but like I said, cash flow is, is key um, with, with everybody extending their terms and, and, and all the very, it's like a perfect storm various different things happening. And to go back to the question you initially asked what the banks are doing, I still think they're sitting on the sidelines. I do. I, I don't think they're doing much in terms of um, of coming outside the box. And, and the underwriting is definitely getting more stringent from what I've seen. Despite the bankers that you talk to, they're always looking for deals. Hey, you know, we want referrals, we want referrals. Right now, it has to be like the ultimate prime A client for them even to look at. Yeah. And, and just to put a, a dot on that too, I think, I think cash flow forecasting, as you said, is kind of the most important factor there. So any client should be doing that with all these moving pieces with, um, and more so for the banks. I think that's what the banks are going to want to see. With, without a doubt. I mean, there's such a demand on, on, you know, there's such a demand now on cash uh, in terms of, like I said, keeping, keeping up with the demand, making sure products coming in, uh, you know, container costs are coming down. Supply chain is a little bit stretched, but uh, a little bit opening up a little bit. But again, that that cash has now got to go somewhere else. You know what I mean? It's it's not like it's it's automatically falling back to the bottom line. The seesaw I gave before, you know, this is coming down, but this is going up. So again, that cash flow has to be managed almost daily uh, in terms of where it's coming in. Um, the pullback of customer terms and then their payments. Uh, we're definitely seeing that um, good good payers are now you know extending a little bit more terms or asking for extended terms um, to help on their own cash flow side because you know the trickle down effect of it. So, so switching gears back, gears back to you, Dr. Basu, what is the biggest risk to the manufacturing and distribution sector in 2024? Right. I mean, look, what are the issues here? I mean, it's cash, cash, cash. I mean, I'm an economist, but I'm also a small business owner. So I spend much of my time actually comparing my accounts to see versus my accounts payable. So what's happening to me as a manufacturer, let's say, my wages are going higher, right? I'm having a tough time retaining and recruiting, you know, highly qualified personnel. You know, my transportation costs are going up. Let's say I use UPS. UPS just signed a five-year deal, you know, with the, through the Teamsters during that negotiation. The, during the fifth year of that new contract, the average full-time UPS truck driver will be earning $170,000 a year. That's wages plus benefits. But it's, it's forced people like myself to ask the question, how do I look in brown? You know, I mean, uh, and, and based on the app, spectacular. But, um, you know, and I, I don't begrudge them that compensation, obviously. The UPS driver is a very special person. They have to be able to drive. They have to be able to park. They have to be able to lift heavy objects as much as 70 pounds or more and pass a drug test. Most Americans cannot do all of those things. So, but the point is that, Given the scarcity of this human capital, 
my wages keep rising, my property and casualty insurance keeps rising, my healthcare benefits keep rising, my workman's comp keeps rising, so on and so forth. But how much more pricing power do I have in a slowing economy? If I'm an exporter, and the U.S. dollar is very strong, and therefore the yen is weak, the pound is weak, the euro is weak. I don't have much price and power. They can't afford as much stuff. And I'm still competing with the Chinese and the Mexicans and so on and so forth. And so that the number one risk, long story short, and that was a long story, is cash flow. It's that a lot of manufacturers now facing tighter credit conditions and less free cash flow are going to run into some constraints. And something has got to give. That's, I think, the big issue for 2020. Well, and, and sticking with that, because Joe, I know you're always monitoring tax policy for our firm and trying to find the best avenues to to reduce overall tax policy or or spend for our clients. Um, we, you've already talked about it. R and D has created some problems with capitalization. Then the interest expense limitations. All of these seem to be kind of stunting the growth of the sector. Do you see any relief coming in those areas, or in the short term or long term? Well, the short answer is unfortunately no. You know, it's interesting that the um, Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, which passed since the end of uh, 2017, contained this R&D provision to stop what was historically the rule that you could expense R&D costs 100% in the years that it was incurred, which was great for the economy, encouraged growth and, and expansion. But in order to get that bill passed uh, under the budget scoring and have the deficits limited, they, need, they needed some revenue raises. This was a revenue raise, cutting back the ability to write off R&D costs immediately. Though no one really wanted to do it because they know of the, you know, the poor effects. So they had it effective in the tax year 2022, not right away, they had a delay. And the thinking was, is bipartisan support will change the law before it ever comes into effect. And in fact, there still is bipartisan support, but they can't get their act together to get it in a proper bill to get it passed. And so now finally, it came into effect in 2022. The IRS issued a notice on this in September of 2023, telling about the regulations they were writing, and they waited so long because they thought the law was going to change. So obviously it hasn't changed. Right now there are four bills in Congress. They've been there for a while. All support to reset it back to the pre-2022 version. But look, it's really anyone's guess, and hopefully it does get done on a retroactive basis. But, you know, you just really can't rely on it, unfortunately. So it remains to be seen. And one of those bills that I was referring to also has a provision to change the interest expense limitation rules back to the 2021 version, where instead of using taxable income, as John was describing, you get to add back your depreciation and amortization expense gives you some relief, so it's back to meet the concept. Again, one bill that's in one bill doesn't look like it's going to pass. So I don't think there's much coming down the pike to change this legislatively. What we are doing in the firm, though, we are actively taking a look to see whether it's uh, there's an ability to recharacterize the interest expense and to capitalize it into fixed assets or capitalize it to inventory so that you get the deduction through either increased depreciation or increased cost to get sold, but not as interest. So we're working on that and hopefully uh, we'll have some, some ideas to do. The other thing which um, somebody mentioned on terms, we have some clients going to their suppliers asking for extended 90 day terms at a higher cost, so they have to borrow less. So again, they're recharacterizing the interest they would have paid to the bank into higher costs of the product, Cost good sale, it's not interest, there's no limitation. So that's uh, that's what we're seeing on that side. Thank you, Joe. And um, as you were talking, a couple of questions came in. I know we were reserving it for the end, but why don't we jump in? Because I think these are valuable. So uh, first one is, which economies, countries do you see emerging as the world's next factory, given the China plus one environment right now? And Dr. Basu, I'll, I'll start with you. Okay, sure, sure. Well, look, I mean, I don't think it's one replacement for China. How can you replace, uh, um, you know, China home to a quarter of global manufacturing? I mean, for decades, the mantra among manufacturers in much of the world, especially the advanced world, Europe and the United States was, hey, I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a profit maximizer. I'm an enterprise. To be a profit maximizer, I must be a cost minimizer. And to be a cost minimizer, I need to probably make it in China or some similarly situated society, but China gains the market share. 
economies of scale, the supply chain is thick, so on and so forth. They have an industrial workforce for the 21st century, all this infrastructure investment. It works for a long time pretty well, doesn't it? But all of a sudden, Chinese policymakers switch gears. They start to get more involved in Chinese economic activity. They start to get more involved in people's business. Uh, and uh, all of a sudden, uh, people are worried about their intellectual property. People are worried about having to enter into joint venture partnerships, you know, involuntarily, just do business in China, so on and so forth. Then, of course, we have the 0809 global financial crisis. Then we have the 2020 COVID crisis. And all of a sudden, supply chains are not working so well. People want simpler logistics. So all of these things have fashioned this reshoring boom back to America. It's been in place for roughly 13 years, but it really accelerates with the pandemic. Now, if, if, the other thing about it is, you know, it, it, many people will say China is no longer investable. It's, it's uninvestable. So if I'm going to produce in Asia now, it's Vietnam, Malaysia, uh, Indonesia, but maybe the biggest winners because they have economies of scale and similar population, India. And whether it's Apple or others, you've heard these high profile stories, the Indians are getting better at quality control, lots of engineers in that population, software and otherwise. And so it seems to me India stands out as being the most likely to gobble up a lot of global manufacturing market share. And then the other, the other player, I think, is the United States of America. Um, $250 billion computer chip manufacturing plants are development in this country. So look at Columbus, Ohio. It's booming. Thank you, Intel. But it's more than Intel, of course. But, you know, Silicon Valley of the Midwest. You know, what's happening in Chandler, Arizona, Sherman, Texas. $40 billion at least in battery manufacturing plants are in development in this country. That's Georgia, Tennessee, Kentucky, Michigan. So mega projects, manufacturing coming back, supply chains thickening. So between... East Asia, South Asia, meaning India, and the United States, I think that, and the Mexico, Mexico as well, I think you're going to see a lot of the restoring victory there and a lot of uh, supply chain uh, disappearing from China. And of course, that process already begun. John, did you have a follow-up? Yeah, I just had a, a comment for Dr. Basu. It's, it's interesting. You know, I've seen a lot more nearshoring within reshoring. You know, uh, Mexico, I know, has a very favorable trade agreement. So I've seen a lot of work move down there. But on your comment of reshoring, you know, some of the biggest things that we've seen uh, or the biggest hurdles have been, you know, obviously we talked about the labor force, the skilled labor, whether or not it's here uh, to take on reshoring or now with everything going on with the cost of capital. So do you still see, do you see all that slowing uh, reshoring or do you still think it's going to have some momentum? Right. Sure. So it, well, it's clearly it slows. It's constrained, right? We don't have the industrial workforce of the 21st century. You might have heard the announcement recently of TSMC, the Taiwan Semiconductor Manufacturing Corporation, which slowed its investment in Arizona. Why? Because they could not find enough workers to outfit the plant. So, yes, that is a constraint. You know, and, and I'll give you an example. In Washington, D.C. recently, and this is not a critique. This is not a criticism at all. And no, no politics here. But there was a prominent official in Washington, D.C. who said, we have a crisis in our nation's high schools. We don't have enough college counselors. They didn't say career counselors. They said college counselors. And we've got to really change that attitude as a people. We've got to put as much prestige on that blue collar production workforce as we do on those jobs that might require, may not, maybe not require a college degree. You know, but this is ridiculous because it's you know standing in the way from us creating more market share in global manufacturing and also a larger middle class. This kind of an anachronistic attitude uh, towards production work, towards blue collar work. It's ridiculous. I mean, as you know, many blue collar workers make much more, more than many white collar workers, and yet it, the, the message hasn't gotten out there, including the young people. So, in any case, yes, it's a constraint. But look. What we have now in America, final point on this: industrial policy making. So the federal government, in particular, is putting a lot of money. The picking winners, you know, subsidizing through tax credits, you know, these this this reshoring, and as long as the federal government is willing to do that, uh, then yes, interest rates are constrained, labor force is constrained. But I still think you'll see a fair amount of the global uh, global supply chain that's on the move end up in the United States of America or in North America general. Well, and, and another question that just came in right on topic is U.S. should do more manufacturing activities within the country rather than relying on other countries. What's your take on this? And I want to go to Joe. Um, you know, one one bill that came out last year was the Chips and Science Act, which was all promoting semiconductors being created in the manufactured in the U.S. Do you see any other policies down the pike that could incent more manufacturing here? And then and Dr. Basu, I'd like your thoughts after. Well, I, I haven't seen any really, um, but you know, one of the things is I was just uh, thinking about Dr. Basu's point, I agree with him. The idea that we're not training for blue collar workers who are 
and, and some of the blue collar, they're highly skilled. And so I'm thinking maybe from a policy point of view, if we had tax incentives for companies to hire children in high school, seniors and juniors, and have an apprenticeship program and not go to college, it's not for everybody, and you get a great job and you have a skill that's hugely marketable, that may be something we should be looking into to build back our, our infrastructure base, which I think is uh, gone away. Now, you know, you work about semiconductors and things. I mean, that obviously you need to go to school for, and it's a different level of education. But I think we have to get back to basics. And you just see what, what this country did in World War II, the production, which is why we and our allies won the war. We don't have that. But we have to get back to that, in my view. Dr. Basu, any, any thoughts? And the original question was, how do we get more manufacturing in the U.S. Um, through policy, is it is it work programs? What are your thoughts? Yeah, I think it's first and foremost educational policy, by the way, because why? What's the mantra right now in U.S. public education? It's teach the test, college preparedness. But every child is different. They have different proclivities, different propensities. So somewhere out there right now in some American college, there's a kid in French literature class uh, being forced to read Moliere's Tartuffe, which is his greatest play. Don't get me wrong, fantastic play. But that person is bored out of their skull. But man, they'd be an amazing welder. They just don't know it because they're not exposed to that. Or carpenter, you know, or pipe fitter, or truck driver, or mechanic, you know, or mill writer, whatever it happens to be. And uh, so what we need to, I think, we need to go back to having a, a two, a, a, a bifurcated high school graduation structure where, yes, if you want to pick the college preparedness track and that's what your you know your future is two year or four year college fine I mean I went to college a lot of us did so what um but then if you have a different track where you want to be prepared for a specific occupational category whether it's in construction manufacturing whatever happens to be logistics then that option is available to you too and and, and we have to hold both of those pathways to graduation with equal prestige we have to accord them equal prestige parents have to accord them equal prestige uh, you know, school administrators have to, uh, you know, CEOs of school systems have to. Then I think we can create the industrial workforce for the 21st century. And then I think we can give the Chinese and everybody else a real run for their money. But until we do that, we're very much constrained. Now, Joe, this, this question's for you. You know, even though we talked about the headwinds in the industry, a lot of our clients have seen tremendous growth through the pandemic and their balance sheets are supported very well between PPP, employee retention credits, um, this has created new business models through e-commerce, expansion into new states, and a lot of clients even building new warehouses. What should what should clients be considering as they enter these new states, build a new warehouse, and expand their platforms? Well, as clients enter into new states in a variety of ways, as you mentioned, Mark, they need to consider what will be constituted as doing business in that state. What activities will give them nexus or contact with the state? which then invokes a whole a series or could potentially invoke a series of tax filings, talking about corporate income tax, sales tax, and even payroll tax to employees. We've spent so much time for the last, what, three and a half years with companies having people work remotely in a state because they're not in the office, they're an office worker, work from home, that's in another state. That company has no business in that state, no contact other than the employee that's working there. You need to see when that will involve filing obligations. So it's really understanding what specifically you're doing in the state or will be doing in the state ahead of time. We do some advanced research and planning and what that means to the company and its filing obligations. And as John mentioned earlier, with a lot of our clients being pass-through entities and the income passing through to the individuals who filed personally, if you're doing business in a state, that income is going to pass through the individual from that state, and they have a state filing obligation. So it's really just understanding where you're going and what the, uh, you know, what you're up against with going to state. Yeah, I think I think what we've seen too is as as clients are expanding into other markets, really talking to their state and local tax professional to make sure they understand the benefits that are out there, right? Credits, incentives, grants. There's a lot of states, even towns within states that that you can almost pit against each other and get more grant revenue out of them. Um, but you have to know who to ask and, and how to ask the right questions. Yeah, we, we see that a lot, especially in the Northeast. You know, when you have you know, Connecticut, New York, New Jersey, 
you know, all within such close proximity to each other, you know, if you're looking to expand, you know, you definitely want to try and pin one state up against the other in terms of, of job creation. Uh, you'll definitely see some some credits out there. I know I think there's an, a, an empire program uh, and various other different things. And I know in New York State, you know, we're also seeing, you know, it's all about looking into it, but there's there could be uh, electricity credits for uh, electricity usage. So there's a lot out there. And, and you know, to, to Joe's point, you know, it's just asking the question, getting together with a tax professional, understand, you know, this is what I'm doing. Or this is what I plan to do. Uh, and going to that state and saying, hey, look, I'm going to create, you know, maybe 50 jobs in New York. What are you going to do for me? You know, what are you going to do for me? If not, I'm going to talk to Jersey and say, hey, New Jersey, what if I bring my 50 jobs here? What would you do for me? You know, so it is a little bit of a game, you know, as frustrating as it is that it's not as forthcoming and it's there and you got to actually look for it, you know, but it's something that if you if you see growth in the future, you definitely want to speak with a tax professional in terms of what types of different credits and incentives could be out there on a state level. I think even on the federal level, too. I'm not as familiar with the federal level, but uh, I know that there are some out there. Yeah, and that's a good point. I, I know in Massachusetts and New Hampshire, you have the mass millionaires tax come through. So everyone's planning on where, you know, where should they start new locations? Should they move to, uh, over the border? Um, but that that is throughout the country. There's always kind of state tax planning that we we can help with or you should be looking at. Yeah, we were um, even find we were even even find credits for a client that we have in Montana. You know what I mean? So it's not just, you know, any any way where you do business, it's 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 always worth, you know, asking the question, hey, I I got jobs here, you know, what's available for me here? Um, but more importantly, I'm creating jobs. You know, that's what it is. Every state wants job creation. So um any anytime you're in that growth mode. But like I said, it's not just relegated to, to the state you're in. It's, you know, states that you do business in. There could be uh, incentives there. One thing, John, Marco, oh, Joe, after you. Um, on a lot of these incentives in the states and the credits, you have to apply for them in advance. It's not like yes. you apply your tax return, you see whether you qualify. So you need to qualify and apply ahead. So as John was saying, there's no substitute for advanced research and planning. You see where you want to go. You know, perhaps pit a state against each other, but see what you have to do to qualify so that when you do decide to go into a state or a particular town, you have, you know, all your ducks in a row so you can vet yourself to the credits because you applied and in many cases got approved in advance. Yeah, they, most of them want to know how many jobs you plan on creating. Now, John, similar topic, as, as we've seen clients grow and expand into new states, they're also starting to outsource to third party logistics providers. To fulfill their inventory, stock their inventory. What have you seen in that space? I, I've definitely seen a growth in it, for sure. Um, and I think a lot of the factors that we talked about today are contributing to that. You know, when you have um, the, not only the cost of the workforce, but trying to staff a warehouse, um, you know, the turnover of those people has been tremendous from our clients. You know, the amount of people that they're training and then retraining just to leave and then go down the block for another $2 an hour. So it's been very frustrating to 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 keep a warehouse staff, um, and again, also the cost of that, um, and then also to speak to Joe's point before on the cost of real estate. Like if you're looking to buy a warehouse or or even sometimes lease a warehouse, you know the cost of 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 that is going up and up and up. So um, you take that and you couple it with the the benefits of a more streamlined logistics. Um, we see a lot of companies um, using that as a as a platform to do business. Um, you know, some strategies that we've seen is having one on the East Coast and one on the West Coast to uh, to service both coasts and make it easier to bring in, depending on which port you're bringing it into. Um, it's definitely reduced barriers to entry for new companies that want to start an online e-commerce business or, or expand an on online e-commerce business. We've also seen it for inventory overflow. So if I have a warehouse um, and and I'm at capacity at that warehouse where I want to reduce my, my you know, my footing in that warehouse where I, I pick and pack. Uh, I might have an overflow warehouse. It's a 3PL that just I set up a relationship with. Product goes directly into there. And then as I need it, I pull it. Um, but we are seeing a more increased increase in um, in setting up these types of relationships to streamline the logistics. Um, there's also some customs and duty benefits in looking into them. So uh, depending on where you're doing business or where you're getting product from, um, we've seen the, the customs process obviously a lot easier going into these 3PLs than they are. Uh, when it's your own bonded warehouse. So um, benefits are out there. Yeah, and I'd say one of the reasons um, that people are considering 3PLs is the labor market, right? Now you now you don't yeah. have to control that. You're outsourcing that. And that kind of leads into the next question. And Dr. Basu, I want to start with you. you. You talked about it a little bit earlier, 
But what do you see with the labor market in kind of 12 months from now, right? It's been red hot. Wages have been high. Is that going to get under control as inflation kind of tampers down? Where, where do you see the labor market going? Well, I think the labor market will be weaker in the sense that I, you know, if I'm predicting recession. So all of a sudden, of course, workers have relatively less, less negotiating power because we're creating fewer jobs, you have fewer job openings, and there are more people who are looking for work because they've just been laid off. You know, we have seen some major layoffs in the last couple of years. Amazon, 27,000 workers, Meta, 21,000, so on and so forth. But by and large, the labor market has remained very, very tight. Um, I think it's going to be a bit weaker going forward. We won't see the wage increases that we've been seeing. But here's the thing. The wages are still growing off a very high level. And you saw that UAW negotiation. You know, I mean, you're talking about 6% year, year-on-year year wage increases for four and a half years, so on and so forth. That's already built in. You can't get away from that. You know, the UPS contract, five, big, chunky gains over five years. So what can I tell you? It's going to get weaker, but workers are still going to be very, very expensive. And I'm not sure they're going to be much more productive. And that's one of the other big issues here is that U.S. worker productivity is just not really picking up because many of our best workers, those baby boomers, are retiring large numbers. And now we're having to rely more on younger workers who seem to have, in many cases, a different attitude toward work. Well, I want to go back to the the auto strike, actually, because I'm curious on your thoughts. We've had, we have a lot of clients either that are auto dealerships or sell parts to components of, of uh, automobiles. What do you see the lasting effects of that strike being? Yeah, it's not clear. I mean, a couple of things. First of all, you have, I think, diminished flexibility among the big three in terms of making that transition to electric vehicles. And maybe that's okay because electric vehicles have turned out to be less popular than many of the main manufacturers have expected. And you know, folks at Mercedes and elsewhere have pointed this out that we're having to work really hard to move these electric vehicles, having to offer steep discounts, and then of course Tesla is discounting their prices serially. And so, you know, that just makes the market that much more competitive and more difficult to make money off of electric vehicles. And there, in America at least, there seems to be you know this very significant stickiness towards old you know fashioned gasoline powered vehicles. So. In any case, that's one thing. Second thing is, you know, these companies are going to face higher wages for years, right? Workers, it was not that workers were inexpensive in America before this UAW set of agreements with the big three, but they're going to become even more expensive, you know, more benefits, so on and so forth. And so at the end of the day, I think that you have a U.S. auto industry that might be slightly less competitive um, uh, after this negotiation than it was before the negotiation. Maybe that's not surprising, but it's an issue. A lot of our clients are seeing kind of a crunch in the finance and accounting department, right, at, at each of one of their companies. What are you seeing from your clients and, and how are how are they getting access, right? The, I think the the rates they're paying a CFO or controller are much higher than they're used to, but also the, the supply of those folks are, are just not out there. You know, how are you helping your clients or what do you see? Yeah, um, it definitely is a crunch. I, I think, you know, not to make this all about accounting, but going back to you know the AICPA change requiring the five year college um, to be a CPA, I, I think we've definitely seen a decrease in people entering the the profession. Um, so that I think is now starting to come to fruition in terms of less people entering, less people staying. So our clients are feeling it uh, in terms of finding people. We're help, you know we're 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 finding it uh, tough to to retain talent in this field. So what are we seeing? We're seeing a lot of our clients take a look at, you know, what what are the the objectives that I need to get done? Uh, and, you know, they're going fractional. You know, how do I, you know, they're outsourcing, whether it be the back office or they're outsourcing, you know, the CFO duties. So they're bringing in needs as they need them rather than a fully loaded salary for an entire 12 months. So, um, you know, we see, especially when a company, you know, small, medium-sized business, when they're ramping up to sell, we see them bringing in a fractional CFO that has M&A experience. Or if we have a client that's negotiating a new bank agreement or something like that, they're bringing in a fractional CFO that has experience in that. Um, you know, if it's financial reporting, again, they're looking for a background in financial reporting. And, you know, the, the labor trend has been, you know, some of these people that are retiring now have strong finance backgrounds and they don't want a full-time job. They've moved to a fractional role. Um, so there's uh, enough of them out there where, you know, those are easy to staff up. They're a lot easier to staff up than, than bringing in somebody on a full-time basis, um, especially when considering the fully loaded wages that you'd have to pay. Uh, you know, the fractional, depending on the arrangement, it's, you know, it's, it's a cost to the company, but they're not burdened with the, um, all the benefits that they have to pay. So we definitely see more and more outsourcing of, of job. And that's not just even in the accounting, you know, we'll look, you know, 
you know, PEOs were a thing for a while, you know, you know, they st still continue to be strong in terms of, uh, of payroll management and, and human resources. But uh, even on the accounting side, we see a lot of outsource. Yeah, and I, I think that plays over to what you said earlier on 3PLs, right? I think clients are getting a little bit more maybe uh, plug and play, right? I, I don't need them they every want, day. They want more off their plate. Yeah, they, they, yeah. <laughs> they almost want to get more off their plate. Yeah, middle, middle market company. I can't afford, you know, a, an expensive CFO every single day, but I need them half the time. Yeah. Um, so that's a, a really good solution, uh, along with IT services and 3PL relationships. Yeah, I mean, managed service providers, you know, MSPs, especially in the IT world, uh, we see a lot more that aren't staffing their own uh, IT function. You know, maybe they'll have somebody on point just to, you know, one person uh, on on staff, but more and more we see MSPs all the time. Now, Joe, kind of put a little spin on that question again on the labor market. Are you seeing any increase in workforce training grants or other uh, other avenues people can go to to kind of incent people to come into the workforce? I, I haven't seen it really in my practice, but I just know that, you know, going back to what we talked about earlier, very you know, you have 50 states and a lot of localities. So every so often, a state will come up with a program, particularly in a targeted area. So it's a question of just staying on top of the changes that are coming out and have a company in a particular area to take advantage of it. That's just really what I'm seeing. Yep. Well, you know, one thing we talked about earlier was, you know, you're keeping an eye on tax policy and bills that are coming through. Um, so we've already talked about Chips and Science Act. There's the other Inflation Reduction Act. There's a lot. Um, are there any specific bills that you see that manufacturing and distribution companies should look at because they have more benefits to the industry. Well, we talked about the inflation reduction, uh, the inflation reduction that came out already. Uh, a lot of things in that really didn't apply, but just a couple of the headline items that received a lot of press was the 15% AMT to C corporations that have financial statement income of over a billion dollars. So that's not gonna apply to obviously the most com companies in the country, but it's worth watching because you know, when Congress needs money, they very often go back to laws that have passed, and maybe it's not a billion as a threshold. Maybe that, that threshold will come down. So it's just something to keep an eye on. And another thing which also received a lot of press was this global AMT, worldwide global AMT of 15%. The United States has said it will not adopt that. So one of the things for companies that have foreign operations got to keep an eye on what's going on in the countries where you're operating to see how that country is going to impose the corporate 15% AMT. I mean, it's nice for someone to agree to with a trade agreement, but they have to change the law in that particular country. And then the second part is, how is the U.S. tax regime going to interface with that corporate AMT abroad when we're not in it at all? So those are a couple of things you've got to watch out for. For companies that are publicly traded, and there are a couple of exceptions, but the Inflation, Redu or the Inflation Reduction Act also imposed a 1% excise tax on the repurchase of corporate stock. And again, that's by publicly traded companies. So that was to dampen companies buying back their stock from the public instead of using the money, retaining it in the company to expand and reinvest in their businesses. So the one thing, though, an important provision there from the taxpayer's point of view is that excess business loss limitation uh, that we were talking about earlier, the uh, Inflation Reduction Act extended that for non-corporate taxpayers to December 31st, 2028. That was one of the myriad of provisions that was supposed to sunset at the end of 2025, this one did. And also in that act, there was a whole series of various personal and business energy credits. So that's something, if you're looking to expand the facility or anything with solar, you've got to take a look at that. There's, there's a lot there. With regard to the SECURE Act, which was also uh, passed, that was more on pension plan-oriented things, a whole laundry list. One of the main things is that companies really want to talk to your pension plan advisors is that they have a mandatory uh, participation increase. They change the law to get more people to apply, uh, to uh, participate in the plan. And that's effective for years beginning after December 31st, 2024. So you have some time. But again, you got to take a look at it and see what um, um, uh, employees are now going to be covered, mandatory COVID that weren't before. They also enhance the ability for part-time people to 
uh, participate in a 401k plan, which I think is great. You know, we're talking about you don't have enough workers, so let's make the work life and the benefits available for a part-time person enhanced, which I think that was a good change. In addition, on the individual side, they made a number of series of changes to the RMD date. That's your required minimum distribution date where you have to take money out of 401k plans, retirement plans, et cetera. So they, they push that back, which is a good thing. You can keep the money earning uh, income tax free for a little bit longer. They've enhanced the penalty relief. A lot of people miss that, you know, and the penalties are onerous. And they've scaled that back and they've also enhanced the ability for older people to make more uh, generous catch-up contributions in 401k plans. So again, a laundry list in there, but those, those are really the main things at this point. Looking at the time, I think we have we have time for one last question, and, and this kind of goes to the lifeblood of any manufacturer distributor is inventory management. And Joe, I want to start with you. I know you have some tax planning ideas that, that people could utilize uh, coming towards year end to kind of manage their inventory and maybe manage their tax balance. Sure. There's a couple of things. One thing that one of the things that we talk to clients a lot about but never really gets implemented is using LIFO inventory. It's last in, first out. So in an inflationary time, when people are replacing the inventory and the cost of the inventory is, inventory is going up and up, using LIFO will allow you to take the last inventory you bought at the highest cost and use that in your cost of goods sold. So your income is lower and you pay less taxes as opposed to older inventory. And in, as I said, with rampant inflation, you know, with the price of your inventory going up, you could save a lot of tax dollars. Now, I'm oversimplifying. It's very complicated, a lot of things you have to do. But one of the most important things is that you then have to use LIFO inventory method on your financial statement. Yeah, you use it in return, you have to use it on your financial statement. So now the income will also be less on your financial statement. So if you're interested in uh, the public markets, your, in, your income is less, particularly if you have loan covenants with the bank and they base it off your audited financial statement, you may run into problems. So that's why I get talked about a lot, not really implemented. In addition, in times where business may be turning down and you're selling off your inventory, so putting aside the value, you actually have less physical inventory. You will be eating in to those layers that we created 10, 15 years ago. And so now your profits will be incredibly large because you're paying back all that deferral. So all these complications. So, but anyway, just something to keep in mind. The other thing we also do in terms of inventory planning is inventory write downs. Now for financial statement purposes, and, and John will correct me if I'm wrong, you, there's a concept of an inventory reserve. If you have inventory, you don't think it's all saleable, something old, whatever, you have an inventory reserve which affects your profit on your financial statement. You don't have a concept of an inventory reserve for tax purposes. However, what you do have, if you have goods in your inventory that can't be sold in a normal way or at the usual prices because they're obsolete, changes in style, with damage, imperfections, broken lots, et cetera, et cetera. If you identify those goods and segregate them and you can value them at the current, at the selling price, less a reasonable cost of disposition. Although one of the requirements is you actually have to offer those goods for sale within 30 days of segregating. But that's a way to kind of get an inventory reserve because you can write it down to the debt realizable value. And that takes planning and it really analyzes your inventory. You can't do a broad brush. It requires going through the inventory floor and seeing what you have, segregating and applying the rules. Well, that's just a couple of ideas. Yeah. And, and Joe, I think, you know, obviously saving tax dollars is really important to our clients. I think you nailed it is we also have to be aware of financial reporting covenants, banking covenants, and even LIFO, for example, is very complicated, very complicated to also explain. Sure. Um, so that is, if you are uh, thinking of switching over, it's something you want to have a conversation with your bank to make sure they understand as well. Um, so, so looking at the time, I think we got through all the questions from the audience. Um, Want to thank the panelists. You guys were fantastic. Really appreciate your time. And, and thank you, everyone, for joining us.